Matt Kibbe. Matt Kibbe is president and chief community organizer at Free the People, an educational organization turning the next generation on to the ideas of liberty. Kibbe is also an executive producer at CRTV, where he produces The Deadly Isms, a documentary series about the dangers of all flavors of authoritarianism. In 2004, Kibbe founded Freedom Works, where he served as president for 11 years. Against his better judgment, Kibbe occasionally gets involved in politics, serving as senior advisor to a Rand Paul super PAC and creating alternative PAC to support liberty candidates. Dubbed The Scribe by the New York Daily News, Kibbe is most recently author of the number two New York Times bestseller, Don't Hurt People and Don't Take Their Stuff, a Libertarian Manifesto. In his spare time, he appears on old media, including Fox News, MSNBC, CNN, and HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher. Please welcome Matt Kibbe. So things are wrapping up here. How did these guys do? What do you think? Was it cool? That didn't sound that awesome. Was it cool? So let's give it up uh, for Wolf and Coco and Malika and everybody that did such an amazing job putting this thing together. I don't know if you guys know this, but, but I like beer. And of course I brought one up on stage. I don't know if you had a chance to try one of these last night. This was the free beer that you got with your ticket. It is a collaboration between a startup revolutionary brewer right here in Belgrade named Dogma and a brewery that you might have heard of in the United States called Flying Dog. Jim Caruso is a fellow libertarian and a very successful entrepreneur in the United States. And this beer was made specifically with a hops called Galaxy, Australian hops that you can only buy in Yakima, Washington in the United States. Somehow, this beer, which was a collaboration, let's say that free labor crossed borders between the United States and Serbia, goods and services from all over the globe went into this beer. Disruptive ideas from entrepreneurs trying to change the way that Serbians think about beer. All of that is in this bottle. And if you tried it, you know <laughs> this beer tastes like freedom. I'm going to put my beer down because I could spend the entire time that I have talking about beer, but I don't want to talk about that. I want to indulge you, if you would, with a personal story, hopefully one that, that matters to some of the policies that we care about. In 2001, when I was in my 30s, I was diagnosed with stage four cancer. My doctor completely unexpectedly found the tumor the size of a small football in my abdomen, right there. I didn't see that coming. The day before that diagnosis, I thought that I would live forever. But I soon discovered that not only was I mortal just like everybody else, but that I might be dead in just a couple weeks. The diagnosis sounded really awful. It sounded like um, this was a, going to be a, a fatal cancer, something that they would, would try to deal with, but they didn't. So I spent two long weeks thinking about dying. I went into surgery. Many hours later, the surgeon came out. My wife, of course, is waiting, expecting the worst. And he says to her, congratulations we can fix this. As it turns out, my tumor was not what they thought it was. It was something else that could be now uh, treated with a chemotherapy drug called atopicide. How is it possible that I went from death sentence to my surgeon coming out and saying congratulations? 
Well, as it turns out, Atoposide and its partner, Cisplatin, were cancer drugs that had only recently been made available in the U.S. market. The FDA had recently approved them, and even though this drug had been discovered in the 1960s, it took that long, 12 years in total, to make it so that that drug was approved by the FDA, therefore legal for my doctor to prescribe to me. So I went from thinking I was going to die to finally thinking, you know what, I might just make it. I also discovered that one of my personal character flaws, which my wife can attest to, I'm kind of a stubborn asshole. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Um, and it was never a good thing. I was stubborn about my ideas and I was stubborn about my philosophy, but finally I found something that I could use my stubbornness for, which is beating cancer. Because chemotherapy, the toxic cocktail that I went through, was brutal. Months and months of feeling maybe like some of you felt this morning when you got up after drinking all night. <laughs> and the cool thing about a hangover is it goes away, but, but um, chemo hangover, it doesn't go away. In fact, it's cumulative, and the more of this poison you put into your body, the worse you feel. You guys probably know some of the symptoms that come along with chemo. You lose a lot of weight. I lost 45 pounds. Um, your red blood cells, your white blood cells, destroyed. Of course, you lose your hair. And you generally just feel like you want to die. I thought, having read the stories at the time, that I wanted to try medical cannabis. I lived in the District of Columbia, and the district had just voted by almost 70 percent to legalize medical cannabis for patients who were dealing with situations like mine. There had been lots of research that suggested that using cannabis, at very least, would make some of the pain go away. Maybe your, maybe your hunger would come back, and maybe you could gain some weight, and maybe a little bit less suffering would allow you to better fight this potentially deadly disease. I discovered very quickly that even though the District of Columbia had legalized medical cannabis, that the federal Congress had passed something called the Barr Amendment by a guy named Bob Barr. Republicans in Congress, the ones that always talk about federalism and, and devolving power back to the states and localities, had intervened to prevent the District of Columbia from allowing patients like me to get access to cannabis. So naturally, I got one of my buddies to go out and try to score me some weed. Um, but I made a mistake because my buddy was a Republican, and he, he dressed in pleated khakis. Hopefully I'm not insulting anyone right now. He had a blue blazer on, he had a striped tie, and you can imagine the kind of back room deal. He went to an alley somewhere to try to score some weed. There's no way anyone's going to sell weed to that guy. So I struck out. And I had to tough it out for no good reason except that some government bureaucrat and some coalition of politicians decided that they were going to demagogue against my choice as a patient to decide to choose cannabis. Imagine if the FDA had not approved those cancer drugs. Imagine if someone else who was diagnosed with the very same thing that I was diagnosed with unfortunately fell in the window between the discovery of the drug and the legal approval of that drug. In that scenario, my doctor would have said, I'm sorry, I know of something that could save your life, but I will go to jail if I tell you about it. That doesn't make any sense, does it? Today in our country, we have an attorney general. Have you heard of this guy, Jeff Sessions? Yeah. Um, he's like your crazy drunk uncle at Christmas, right? He just says the craziest things. He said about people that smoke marijuana, good people, don't. He went on to say that 
Many patients that are prescribed opioids by their doctors need to suck it up and take an aspirin. Now, I can tell you, in my case, after multiple surger surgeries, after losing a kidney, um, without opioids, I probably would have died. It would have hurt that bad. And if you know anything about patients and about healing, if you're suffering in that kind of chronic pain, you don't get better. Opioids in our country are now demonized. Our attorney general has decided that they are going to cut the total use of opioids, and they're going to be checking with physicians to make sure that they're not prescribing too many. Now, there is an opioid problem in our country. There is an opioid problem that could be readily improved by legalizing things like medical cannabis. I have a friend, Christine Stenquist. She is a mom in Utah who, when she was 22 years old, she was diagnosed with a benign brain tumor, one that was still life-threatening. She went into surgery, she stroked out, she died on the table, they brought her back to life, but when she woke up, she was in excruciating pain. She couldn't function, she couldn't stand. She laid in bed, she laid on the couch, she spent the next 12 years trying to raise her children from a bed. All the while getting more and more opioids that did not manage the pain. It only got worse, it, it didn't get better. And if you know anything about opioids, you spend too much time on opioids and it screws up your body. It does real damage to your ability to function as a human being. She eventually, exhausting every other option, talked to her dad. Her dad was a drug enforcement agent in Miami, Florida. And she said, Dad, I've been reading about medical cannabis. I don't know what else to do. Can I try this? What do you think Dad said? Dad said, yes. For all of the uh, trappings of drug enforcement and politics and, and political parties and ideologies, it turns out that when it's your daughter, you make a rational decision. You don't make a political decision. Christine went from dysfunctional, lying in bed, to finally having not just an active life, she's insane. I've spent a lot of time with her in Utah. She's now an advocate. She organizes patients to try to pass, as we speak, legalized medical cannabis in the state of Utah. Utah is the most conservative state in the United States, but it is also a state where 80% of the voters and over 50% of conservatives support that choice. I want to show you a couple of videos that I made with Christine. I broke three of my vertebrae in my spine. I shattered my sacrum. I broke both of my hips. I broke my right ankle and my right heel, um, falling down a cliff with my ATV, and the cliff had boulders on the side of it that crushed me over and over again. I came out of the hospital um, two months later in a wheelchair, a full body brace, um, a cast on my right leg. I was not even 23 years old yet, so I lost much of my life. Um, I quickly became addicted even though I didn't necessarily recognize it or want to recognize it. I gained 60 pounds um, over five and a half years. August of 2015, I chose to quit my job. I broke up with my boyfriend and I quit my medications cold turkey. It took me three months at home alone to detox. Um, two suicide attempts later, I finally started feeling clear headed uh, in November of 2015 and I. I worked to rebuild my life from scratch. The only way that I got through all of this was with medical cannabis. 
I am more clear-headed more now than ever. Um, I'm able to do so much more. I've been able to lose 60 pounds in a year. Um, I've been able to stay off of my medications, uh, not drink. I've been able to work significantly more. I've been able to volunteer significantly more. I volunteer for three nonprofits on top of my full-time job. Um, so really, it saved my life. Um, legalizing medical cannabis in Utah really is more about choice. We don't, you know, as a medical cannabis advocate, I'm not saying that everyone should get on medical cannabis for pain relief. But I do think that if I was given the choice coming out of the hospital to either choose opioids or cannabis, I at least had a choice. I had a safe legal option. I think I would be in a much different position than I am now. Um, and I think, you know, I wouldn't have been severely addicted for nearly six years of my life. When I was 18, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, MS. I'm actually a fourth generation autoimmune in my family. And I went downhill quick. I was trapped in my home. I was unable to do anything. I couldn't clean, I couldn't use my computer, I couldn't use my phone. I, have, I, I used to have bad vertigo and spasticity in my leg and I was combi confined to my home or I was in a wheelchair if I left. And that was not okay. <laughs> it, it got to the point of depression, suicidal thoughts. Uh, I, I couldn't do anything. It's, it's isolation, it's a prison. The reason that I started using cannabis was because of the, the year, number of years that I've been diagnosed with MS and the amount of prescription drugs I have been put on for this disease. I've been told more than a few times from my doctors, you may not wake up in your sleep, you may stop breathing because of all the benzodiazepines that I'm on. About three months into using cannabis, I was able to start jogging down the street for about 0.12 miles oh, wow. a night. Wow. And it's up to more than that now. And don't use my wheelchair anymore. I could not keep it quiet. I couldn't. It's too big. There's too much hope in this. There's too much in this, this medication, cannabis is helping this disease with no cure. Right. I, I can't be quiet about that. Ashley went until she was 18 before she decided to start having seizures. Oh, wow. But when she started having them, she was having some full-blown um, tonic-clonic grand mal full-body seizures. Um, we tried a lot of different drugs. We tried five different uh, treatments with Ashley uh, with no success, um, still having breakthrough seizures, full body seizures, and the side effects were horrific. She was pretty much turned into a zombie. And through self-education, um, realized that we had an option and talked it over with her neurologist, which was kind of funny, walking into the office and she said, okay, I would like to do a, a vagal nerve stimulator, which is like implanting a defibrillator in there. And I said, I, I think that that's a little bit invasive for this child. And she said, it's really not that bad. And I said, how about something non-invasive? And she said, such as, and I said, cannabis? We saw a 50% reduction in the number of seizures mm -hmm. and the length of those seizures, the severity of them. So she, was, she went anywhere from 10 to 25 seizures a day um, down to four to six. We tried um, adding THC while we were over in Colorado. Oh, okay. And, uh, <laughs> she had her first zero seizure day in years. I couldn't believe that just because we were on the other side of a state line, we were not allowed to treat our 
<laughs> I'm getting kind of emotional here. Um, Why do you do this to me? <laughs> So she went from two dozen seizures a day to zero <clears throat> while we were over there. Just by um, adding one cannabinoid. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that uh, the thing that really pushed me into uh, lobbying for THC was just the idea that we knew. <laughs> wow. We knew that it worked. Why can't we have it here? So here's a question. Here's a question. Should you get to choose whether or not chemotherapy drugs like cisplatin and etoposide are things that you want to do? Should you get to choose whether or not medical cannabis is a good choice for you? Should you and your doctor decide whether or not the prescription of opioids is the right way to go? All of these stories that I have told you tonight are really stories about healthcare policy. They're really a question about whether or not there should be a bureaucrat or a politician or a middleman or some gray suit Soviet whose name you will never know is deciding for you what health care you get, what health care you're denied. Now we've had these arguments, every one of you in every one of your countries has had these arguments as more and more places centralize and socialize and bureaucratize medicine and patient choices. And we always have the best data, we always have the most impe impeccably logical arguments against government-run medicine. And my leftist friends, my progressive friends in the U.S., tell a story. They tell a story about a person who wants to make their lives better. Why am I burdening you with these stories? This is not nearly as fun as beer. But I feel like today we have an opportunity never had before. We have an audience, I call them the Liberty Curious, that basically is everybody at least everybody on Facebook. And that's a lot more people than are in this room right now. My team at Free the People, we spent the morning talking to a professor who has spent the last 10, 15 years trying to dig up the truth about communist atrocities in former Yugoslavia right here in Belgrade, Serbia. And he found old newspapers from 1944, 1945. The Nazis had been defeated. The Communist Party took over. The Stalinist system was going to be implemented in Yugoslavia. And the party, those that controlled the lives of the people, would publish on the front page of the local paper who had been assassinated for thought crime, for being an enemy of the people. I probably kind of knew that that happened because the story is true everywhere you go when government gets too much power. It doesn't matter if it's fascism or socialism or communism. It's always the same way. One thing I learned today that I had never heard before, but it seems so obvious now. Some of the people on the front page of that paper Actors, artists, poets, they hadn't committed any crimes. They weren't with the Nazis. They were dangerous because they knew how to tell a story upstream of political ideologies. And I think we need to understand 
and maybe take a lesson from that. If Tito thought that a poet was dangerous, maybe we need to do more poetry. Maybe we need to make more music. Maybe we need to make more videos because things have changed. You could be frustrated by the fact that politics today is trying to force every undecided young person to choose between these two horrific options. You guys all know the political spectrum that runs from left to right. You learned, you learned about it in grade school. And on the far left, you have, this will be your left over here, you have communism and socialism and the experiment in, in war communism in the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia and Tito, Mao Zedong in China. We know these stories and they turned out horribly. But when you're taught about these things, it kind of sounds like socialism and communism, you know, they didn't get it quite right, but man, they really had their heart in the right place. And then you go over here, the other extreme of the political spectrum, and you learn about nationalism and fascism and Nazism. And there's no, there's no cutting corners here. Those guys are bad people. They're racist, they're bigots, they're monsters. They murdered millions and millions of people. But when you think about it, and you dig into the history and you discover what Tito did to Serbians right here where we're standing right now, what, what's any different? Why would you choose between one of these two things? It's our job to make sure that everybody knows that those are fake choices. That is not the conversation we're having today. The choice is whether you want to give government and bureaucrats and the machine, the establishment, all that power and hope that they don't turn it on you. Or you could rise up from authoritarianism and talk about cooperation and choice and people getting along, even though some of us live on this side of the border and some of us live on this side of the border. And the beautiful things that happen when people are free and entrepreneurs are allowed to create and break rules and poets are allowed to question their government, all of that stuff is what we represent in this room. When I, uh, when I spent those two weeks thinking that I was dying, I thought about all the things that I hadn't done yet. And when I got better, it made me a radical. It made me realize that I was impatient about people that would accommodate seeing the problem. People that would look the other way when bad things were happening. People that would accept the status quo because, you know what, it's always been that way. It's not acceptable when the clock is ticking. So here you guys are. You're young. You're immortal. You have all these beautiful tools because of technology and social media that allow you to talk to millions and millions of people in dozens of languages across the long tail of the internet. What are you guys going to do with that? My suggestion is that you tell a story. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>